I'm Andrew Kitley, and this is my podcast, The Invisible Gift, a show about turning disability into possibility. From a young age, I was told I had a disability that would make it impossible for me to achieve and flourish in life. I struggled in school and felt I was not truly understood or supported. On my long road to becoming the owner of multiple businesses, I have learned that dyslexia was not my disability, but rather my invisible gift. My dyslexia challenged me every day, but it was also what made me into an independent thinker, a creative and gave me that hardworking mindset that has taught me to never be discouraged by failure. I realized there are many people out there just like me. So I wanted to learn more about them and dyslexia itself. I realized I needed a way to do this, which was great for dyslexics, which obviously rules out writing anything down and makes total sense why a podcast is perfect. I'm excited to be sharing this journey with you as we learn more about dyslexia, the incredible people that thrive with it, and how we can all transform our greatest challenge into our invisible gift. Welcome to my podcast. Today I'm joined by the multi-award winning artist and inventor, Jim Rockus. Jim began his career making models for Hollywood blockbusters before becoming an inventor and a designer. He's totally unique and set up the first ever dyslexic design exhibition that happened in London in 2016. The exhibition challenged the perceptions of dyslexia by accentuating the positive effects in unique perspectives in art and design. We spoke about his career in inventing, his views on positive dyslexia, and we also enjoyed a glass of dyslexic wine. Yep, I was intrigued when I heard about this too. But as always, I kicked off by finding out when he first found out he was dyslexic. So Jim, thank you for coming in on the show. Great to finally meet you. Thanks so much for having me. Great. So um, we're here to talk about the wonders of, of dyslexia. Um, first question that I'd like to ask everyone is, when did you discover you were dyslexic? Uh, yeah, um... So I went to boarding school at the age of nine and I think I became of dyslex- became aware of dyslexia then because some of my friends in class were dyslexic mm-hmm. and we had these horrendous French lessons, um, which I hadn't had till then. And I was always bottom of the class and some of the dyslexics didn't go to these classes. They went to extra English classes and the teacher was very nice. She gave us, gave them Kendall mint cake and said it's brain food and this sort of thing. And, uh, I'm like, why am I struggling in this French class every week, not knowing at that point I was dyslexic, when, you know, you can be dyslexic and go to these classes and get Mm. bribed with sweets and things. And, uh, you know, every week there'd be a little exam and every week I'd get the lowest grade, which was E. And um, so I thought, right, um, I said to my parents, "I I think I'm dyslexic, you know, just as a way to get out of these French classes. And so I was set up for the dyslexic test and I knew a little bit about it from my friends. I knew that they're good at um, 3D thinking, visual Mm. thinking, problem solving, less Mm. good at spelling, general knowledge and that sort of thing. So I did my best to exaggerate my strengths, you know, in the dyslexic areas and and particularly spell badly that day. So, of course, the result comes back and uh, they're like, oh, you're dyslexic. That's amazing. That's a revelation. I'm thinking, well, yeah, I don't know about that, but I don't have to do French anymore. So um, I went. (laughs) So I then went to these extra English classes and life was much better. I didn't have to go to these terrible French lessons. And uh, after a year, they do a a recap test to see how, how much the extra classes have benefited you. And I was feeling quite guilty by that point about this enormous lie that I hadn't told anyone about so I did my best Mm. and uh, they said well it's really paid off your 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 spelling and your reading age it's leapt years ahead Mm. Um, and I'm like oh this isn't good Um, I'm like well am I still dyslexic and uh, they said well yeah of course because you know you're still this many years behind where you should be and look look at the difference in ability you know on these you're really strong in these areas Mm. you're really weak and this this is the dyslexic profile, so I needn't have, um, you know, cheated the first time round. So I think that was probably, to answer your question, that was probably around the age of 11. Mm. So boarding school, how was that? Because I've always wondered, I've always, my parents, ironically, were going to send me to boarding school because I was a pain in the ass, and they thought that might be a solution. Yeah. And um, 
I've always wondered what boarding school was like, especially not so much with dyslexia, just generally. Just general. How did you feel about boarding school? I'm more interested in that. Um, so I, I've got an elder brother and he went to boarding school. And then my mm. parents said to me, do you want to go? You know, it might be good for you. I'm like, yeah, I'll give it a try. Mm. So I went off and I don't know, after a few weeks or months, I'm like, no, nah, it's not for me. I was very homesick. I was nine years old and... Uh, they're like, well, you know, I think it's good for you. you give it, give it a try now. You know, let's just stick with it. I'm like, oh, okay. So it's actually permanent. Damn it! It's <laughs> <Yeah>. too late. <laughs> it was. It wasn't bad though. It was. It was a great school, and um, I did go home at weekends. And you know, you. It's not. It's not that bad. You know, no, I. I always think when I think boarding school now. I, I think before I didn't really know because there was nothing. I knew a few people that been to boarding school, and they yeah. always seem to be a lot more maturer the yeah. people who went to normal schools strangely um and they're more self-sufficient as well because they used to doing a lot more things on their own mm -hmm. but they also was a bit more of a nightmare because they're so used to being free at such a young age but when i think of boarding school i think harry potter yeah yeah i was going to say that it, it, it is like that yeah. yeah it's it is that sort of environment yeah um, which must be great right yeah. you spend all your time with your yeah with your with friends, friends after school, yeah, 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 the friends you're in class with. Because um, I think back when I was younger, I would have done anything to spend all that time yeah, with my friends. Yeah. It must have been really... And I had these, I don't know if this is a dyslexic thing, I had these, what I thought was two different friends. Mm. There was this friend that I had in the dormitory who slept in the bed next to me, mm. and the friend that I went round class with. Mm. And because of the different, the uniform and the pyjamas and I don't know, I didn't realise it was the same person. I thought I had these two what? really good friends. And at some point it dawned on me gradually it was the same person. Surely they had the same name, right? Um, I didn't really do very well with name people's names. I so am the, I'm terrible. I didn't use with names. names. I don't I don't know your name, even though I've been told it. I've been on your LinkedIn this mm. morning. Don't the, know, you don't the, know James's name either. Jack, no, I was thinking it's you, James, or is the other chap, James? Yeah. Um, and it's you. I was going to hazard a guess. Yeah. Um, and I can remember that because I'm Jim, and yeah. he said, this is James. And I thought, do you mean I'm James? And yeah, I'm very I get, easily... I get told off a lot for not remembering names. People always say uh, to me, especially in business. Yeah. And what is your name? Andrew. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. By the way, for everyone listening, yeah. my name's Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we've had it. All, yes. Yeah, so I, it's funny, you, I've got to admit, that I'm not, I'm not that bad name. with names. So I'll have it now, because of the story brought, it, I'll have no worries. I've got a way to remember it now. So I'm still fascinated, you throw me straight off the dyslexia. I want to know about this. these two friends that are actually it's, one person. Yeah. That's blown my mind. Yeah. So that's more of an insight into a, a more of a interesting part of dyslexia. So, Well, well, it, if, who knows if it's part of the dyslexia or just me being... A, an or, idiot, or maybe yeah. he had split personalities. <laughs> he could have. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I suppose you do have a more chilled out way of going about things in the afternoon and the evening than you do during the day when you're switched on. And I don't know, it might be that and the uniform. And um, But it's funny, it took me so long to notice. That's, you know, that's that's great. I love that. Like a superhero so <laughs> goes away, changes clothes, you don't realise it's the same person. Yeah. Wow. So what did you, what, what strengths did you find that dyslexia gave you and then, or, and some of the weaknesses? Because obviously it, it comes in so many different sizes and shapes and everyone always has something that they generally excel at and other people have something that they're not so good at and that might helps them excel in other areas. So for you, what was, what was the thing that you, you noticed dyslexia, if any, had a positive effect on your life what, what did you know soon learn you became good at I think at school when I was thinking what I wanted to do when I was grown up I thought well there's all these things you can buy in shops I'll just invent something like that and it'll be easy and I'll get a few made and I'll sell them hmm. little did I know how incredibly difficult it is but it is what I have ultimately gone on to do and um the other so I, I suppose I was aware of it yeah, back then. And then in my adult life, I've noticed I'm, I'm just much better at working things out um, wherever I am, whatever I'm doing, than trying to remember or look up what to do. Mm -hmm. um, I think for a dyslexic, it's mu much easier to create something than to remember 
how to do something. Yeah. So you're sort of thinking on on the fly all the time. So what age were you when you invented your first thing, whether it's small? So for um, me, my first business technically when I was, I think, I think 13. Yeah. So wow. When what was, was that at 13? Uh, <laughs> one of my friends got me to sell sweets for him. Yeah. And I wanted to try and save some money. So I, um, I said, if you can bring me in lunches, I can save the money in my pocket money. My parents were giving me for food. So he used to bring me food in, and then I realised. I, I said to my dad, "Can you buy it? Can I? Can I go?" And, he used to have a macro account, uh, macros, and he said, "I said, can you buy some sweets, macros? I'll sell them, and when I earn the money, I'll pay you back." And he said, "No chance." So um, then I, I I had to try and find a way of making more money. So I realised if I put, I knew how much he was expecting back per sweet. If I increased the price of them, I could take the difference, pay him the money he expected, and I don't have to fork out on inventory. And that's what I've done. So that wow. technically was my first business, and I ran yeah. that for three years. Wow. Um, and then I progressed to selling cigarettes, which was probably <laughs> not the best thing to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, it's interesting. I mean, back to me faking my first dyslexia test, I think it yeah. is a dyslexic thing to think around problems and yeah. find solutions. Um I think my first invention was on my art foundation year. Mm. So I came out of school with an A-level in art, um, had these very extreme results. I had a, an ungraded for, I think it was maths, mm. and I got an A for art. So I did an art foundation year, and it was, it was so joyful to just be doing art all year. Yeah. Anyway, the project they sent me, I didn't, I think it was a storage project. We had to make something to store things on our desk and I didn't really take to it. Mm. I think at that time my view of what product design was was quite narrow and it was sort of injection molded things that are mass produced and I was trying to make like a fairly dull plastic container and I ju it just wasn't working for me and to my tutor's credit she said well I'll just give you a different project um, mm. and she said I'll give you my fish project um, and I'm like oh that sounds good. Um, uh, and there wasn't really more to it than that. I just had to do something fish related. So I invented this dolphin toilet roll holder. Now, I do know a dolphin isn't a fish, but for me at the time, it was <laughs> just to clarify that for everyone listening. Fish, yeah. The comments fish -like. were made, Is Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> That's um, not a fish. But yeah. But um, it was um, so I had the toilet paper on the roll. Yeah. And as you pull the paper, mm. um, you know, it kind of rolls. Mm. And uh, on top of it, I had these three cams, mm. three wheels. And between the wheels, there were two pegs. So as as the paper turns that way, the, the cams turned that way. And it mm. made this up and down movement of the pegs between. And on these, I had two dolphins. Yeah. And they were slightly offset, the cams. So they were sort of leaping and they were hinged at their tails. And they were MDF. And uh, yeah, and, that, you know, as you do your stuff, they're, they're leaping like that, like they're on the waves, like on the ocean. And, uh, and as the paper gets used, they're gradually diving down because, you know, it's getting lower. Yeah. That, <laughs> that was, yeah, my first invention. And my first business, I suppose, they, they, uh, the tutor said, well, you know, you've got demand for these. You know, they were very popular at the show. And so uh, yeah. right after the foundation year, I started production and I sold them far too cheap. I think I sold them twelve ninety nine. Yeah, And, I, you know, it was like... Uh, like my own sweatshop where I was the worker and I was, yeah. they really sold well. <laughs> the question is, is does someone still have them on the wall? That's the thing. Um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, um, yeah, we'll come to know from when it gets broadcast. Well, well yeah, you go. <laughs> one day someone's going to yeah, go, that's somebody, original. And they're, they're selling it for 12,000. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And ho hopefully they won't, hopefully they're still working and they won't, track me down say look you need to do some maintenance <laughs> yeah. on the you didn't offer a warranty it's fine. no no <laughs> so um so that was your first invention from that point there did you know that's what you wanted to be an inventor so originally on the foundation year i thought i wanted to do graphic design mm -hmm. and they managed to talk me out of it because apparently i wasn't very good at it <laughs> right and um instead i did 3d design yeah and I just, I don't know, I just, I think it was because I did, I specialised in graphics at A-level and I was very good at it at A-level, but then when it took a step up 
I wasn't quite on it. And um, I, I did much more enjoy the 3D. Mm. Um, and I went in there and it was just much better. And from that, I thought I was going to do craft because I enjoyed making things. But I didn't get accepted onto any of the craft courses. And as a backup, yeah. I'd put this HND in model making and I didn't really know what it was. Yeah. And um, it was at this college and uh, it was an agricultural engineering college and uh, and furniture as mm. well. It was Rycote College and it was in Tame in Oxfordshire. And um, people were either called spanners or chippies. Mm. And on the back of the chippy, the furniture course, they kind of made this model making course. Mm. And it was uh, for architecture and products and uh yeah that sort of thing and advertising but I, I struggled with it because i wanted to be creative and model making by its nature is you're given a drawing and you're asked to replicate or build yeah. that and it, it wasn't i mean it is very creative but i was i wanted something a bit more broad so now how many things at this this stage in your life have you invented i don't know <laughs> um, <laughs> I've got the candle holder, yeah, which I've discovered is not a candlestick holder, yeah, because a candlestick is it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> um, so that's coming out later this month, and then there's the gauge flower vase. Then there's the what's a gauge flower vase? I'm fascinated. It does it tell you when it's run out of water? Yes. Oh. Yeah, I could yeah, be a, I yeah. Could be a inventor. <laughs> <laughs> it, um, yeah, it's got a it's got a wobbly base. Yeah. So and so, do you work a lot? It sounds like you work a lot with equi equilibriums. It sounds like you like balance in your designs. Is that? Yeah, that I do seem to. Yeah. It's something... Well, you've you've mentioned three things that are all kind yeah. of all about equili equilibrium. Let's <laughs> say, go. That's my dyslexia. Can't even say equilibrium. Yeah. Um, why do you think you're interested in that? I don't know. I don't know why it should be that in particular. But I, I like, um, although although I got an ungraded for physics A level, I, I am mm. quite interested in the way things actually move. So not so much the maths behind it, mm. but the result. And I like to play around with shapes and physical properties of things and just imagine what they'll do and then try it out and see how how well my imagination generated what's actually going to happen, because which you must have to do with buildings and that sort of thing. To yeah, physics to me makes sense. Yes. Whereas it makes the world, a confusing world, make sense. Yes. But then I also love the complete opposite side of it where you've got cha chaotic um, emotional tendencies that come mm -hmm. in between the two. Mm -hmm. But for me, I like if you can... Physics for me is to say there's there's a wrong and right answer. There's never mm -hmm. any gray areas. But then mm -hmm. I have the art complete other side, which is like what we're doing here, where we're talking and and it's opinions and emotions, where that completely throws all that out the window. Mm -hmm. It's again y kind of yin and yang. Mm -hmm. You've got two opposite sides of the world, and that's how it merges for me. But what I say, the reason why I ask you about the reason why you like Finn's balancing is because they say when we create something it actually tracks to the, our pro, our mind process. Mm. So when you create things, it can sometimes be a need you have to create something that you regularly think about, which is obviously Finn's balancing equilibrium. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was asking, have you ever looked, have you ever asked yourself why that particular form of inventing oh, or creation is... No, it's made me think of something. Because uh, when I was at, at the school, the Harry mm. Potter school, I used to go around... <laughs> just collecting things from the playground floor, just bits of rubbish, bits of broken stationary kit, anything. Yeah. And I would just put it inside my desk. Mm. I had this incredible desk. Um, you know, there'd be all my sort of work on the top. You could just about get the lid closed. And at the back underneath, there'd be a load of junk mm. from the schoolyard. And every now and then, I don't know, once every couple of terms or so, I'd bring it all out and I'd just start... I don't know, balancing them on top of each other. I'd get on the back of a chair, maybe that would be where I'd start building and I'd get a ruler and then I'd start hanging things off. And then my friends would come and they'd join in, they'd start adding things on and it would be it would be fun. Well, that's similar to interior designers. Mm -hmm. I didn't realise this. I watch again, we were talking about mm -hmm. earlier about um, Masterclass and this is where mm -hmm. they have interior designers on mm -hmm. there. And I just assumed 
I'm into architecture. I'm assumed it was like architecture where you design, you have concepts and stuff like that. But interior designers get everything from the world around us. So mm-hmm. they'd be walking on a beach and they pick up lots of different stones and they mm-hmm. put it away in a cupboard. And it might not mean anything now, mm-hmm. but in three years' time when you're designing something, that colouring, that 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 texture will come back to you mm-hmm. and it will fit perfectly within a room. Mm-hmm. And that's how they work. So yeah. really, you're kind of almost stepping into the realms of um, that sort of creative side of it. So yeah. you put something somewhere yeah. for later on. Yeah. It's, it's a... So with all this kind of creative vision you had throughout school and some of the issues with your, your learning, although you kind of faked it to begin with even though it was there yes um how do you think the kind of trials you had when you were younger work into how you've ended up where you are now i mean what what strengths have you gained through what could be perceived as losses at a younger age i think having failed through so much of school Mm -hmm. i think there's a willingness to fail and take risks and to be ready for it and i think a person who hasn't had such a grounding in failure, you know, they they tend to do things that they think are going to work out. Mm -hmm. So with my design work, I won't know if it's possible or not what I'm trying to achieve. So with the gauge flower verse, um, Mm -hmm. the idea was to make a container of liquid that as the liquid level reduces, it'll lean over more. Mm-hmm. And it was going to be a wine decanter, but I thought, well, I've got a wine decanter. So, you know, it's all, yeah. so it was going to be if though it kind of got more and more drunk. But then I thought, I've got a wine decanter. It's going to be a flower vase. So as the mm-hmm. flower drinks the water, so there's less water, it leans over and more and more, letting you know to give it a top up. And I didn't mm-hmm. know. So I had to sort of make a mechanism for this yeah. to achieve this leaning. And I didn't know if it was possible. I didn't know what shape it was going to be. Um, and I think quite... In retrospect, it was a bit daft. I spent a year thinking about it before I had anything built. And mm. I was just playing with this shape in my mind. And I thought, yeah, I think it'll work. And then at the glass blowers, there was the prototype. And I just put a pencil inside and had the water. And it, it did stand up. And I poured the water out and it lay down. And it was it was really good. It worked. Um, so I think, I think dyslexia brings resilience and willingness to take risks. Um, and then naturally, dyslexics are very good at three-dimensional thinking and visual thinking, which, you know, is great for a product designer or 3D designer. Um, and I think very good imagination and, uh, you know, that's good for generating new ideas for things. And back to your comment about the interior designers, actually, mm. although you describe it as a physical thing, yeah where they gather all these things, I don't know, from the beach, you say, for example, and then they come back to them, I think, well, anybody really, not just dyslexics, Mm. in their mind, they're collecting everything they see and it all goes into storage in the mind and then it sort of gets re-put together in different ways to come out as something else. So how did you cope with failures when you were young, not even younger, early in your career as well? Because... We always talk about failure, and I think talking to lots of dyslexic people, it seems to be the most common reoccurrence failure is yeah. is the kind of power you're given. Yeah. Um, when Were you aware of your failures when you were younger, or are they something you look back and realise now? Because for me, I only, I only realised all my failures as I've got older mm. and I've looked more back. But at the time, I didn't realise there were failures. I just tried again and is that just wondering how you experienced it and what you done with it i think now when i'm working on a design i don't really look at it as a failure mm. um i just you know i do the best with i can first for time around and then i'm like okay how can i improve this i've got this wine glass here actually this is this isn't finished yet this is a work in progress mm. and i thought i thought that was going to be finished um mm. it's kind of like for for white wine, you can hold it like that so you're not warming the glass up too yeah. much. Um, and, you know, red wine, you can hold it like that if you want. Um, and on, on a table, you know, it can have its positions. Um, so that was to go with the decanter. But what I discovered was it doesn't work sufficiently well in that mm. 
if it's on a dining table, so in order to pick that up, I can't, if, if it's a white wine and I need to grab it like that, it, 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 you know, that's too awkward. Yeah. Um, I've got to put down my knife and fork, pick it up with this hand, place it into that hand, have my drink, yeah. place it back into that, put it back on the table, and then I can pick up my knife and fork again. That's too much to ask of somebody who's just having trying to have a conversation with their dinner. Yeah. So I've realized I do need the three angles, three bases, so that it can one can be on the table and then you can pick it up by the other two. So I didn't consider it I don't consider that a failure. I'm really happy with it. I think it's lovely, but it, it's just not finished yet. Well, that's, that's what I mean. As an adult, we've come up, we call it trial and error yeah. as we get older rather than yeah. failure, don't we? Yeah. Or there's different terms, fail forward and stuff like that. But I yeah. just think the thing that I find dyslexic people find resilience in it. Yes. That, uh, I, I speak to some friends who don't have dyslexia and yeah. succeeded very well at school. Yes, yeah. And when they first experience failure is very late in their life because if you go mm -hmm. through it, if you go through education mm. and you generally do either the the average or you do above average, mm -hmm. it's you don't have many failures unless you mm -hmm. participate in something outside of uh, academia like sports mm -hmm. and then that kind of builds up. But yeah. I find by the time dyslexic people are relatively young adults, we've failed so much over and over again that... Yeah. It doesn't really matter if it goes wrong, but yeah. So, are you going to change your glass? Now, I'm interested. Now you've talked about the glass. <laughs> so, so, yeah. What I've got to do is, um, I'm trying to think where it's going to be. There's going to be another of these punts. I call them there. I think yeah. it's going to be, um, yeah. So this will be a right-handed one, and then you can pick it up like that. And have you checked it for women with small hands? Um, not yet. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, just, yeah. Might have just thrown another spanner in. No, no, maybe, yeah. Maybe maybe uh the next one Just because I'm thinking if that, another, if that was yeah. you'll probably pour the wine up to what, mid mid thumb level? And Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's about that's a person with a very small hand would struggle lifting that, I think. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. I'll give you my number off. You can bounce on Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> you, yeah. Jim's points on failure sound so familiar to me. He doesn't seem intimidated at all, and it totally explains why he can be so free with his inventions and his work. Jim totally believes in what he does. His mind and his art is so unique, and the results are extra special. When Jim arrived at the recording today, he brought with him this infamous dyslexic wine. I was keen to find out why, and of course, crack the bottle open. So why have we got the bottle of wine here? Right, yes. Um, so I had an idea a few weeks ago. So there's all, there's all types of um, different types of brain architecture of which dyslexia is one. Mm -hmm. You know, there's dyslexia and Asperger's and uh, ADHD mm -hmm. and, uh, and so on. And I think they're all advantageous. Mm. I think... Um, within a community, it's useful to have a few people that look at things in different ways. Now in school, ADHD is terrible. Mm. You know, you have to sit in class uh, for hours at a time and do fairly dull work for, and um, it, you know, it's just not compatible. However, if you have an entrepreneur who's spinning lots of plates and keeping lots of things running at the same time, if they've got ADHD, that's actually really good. It's a strength, yeah. They can move their attention all over the place very quickly mm -hmm. and they're just aware of everything going on at once. Yeah. Um, so I thought, I wonder if you can map all of these different time, types of brain architecture, mm. how, what it would be. I thought, well, maybe you can map it on a sphere, a yeah. globe. And yeah. I thought, well, you know, we live on this globe, the planet Earth, and... Um, all over it, there's different environments and these places could, I'm not quite sure, these places could be, you know, part of the world could be the dyslexic part of the world. The conditions there are dyslexic and, mm. you know, we grow wine or, like, or grapes all over the world. Yeah. And wine, as I learn more about it, um, it's very complex. You know, uh, 
wine from any region o- throughout the world, it's it's different, and mm. it's different even from year to year from the same place. Yeah. And I challenged myself to track down a dyslexic bottle of wine. So, a a I'm not sure a, a, a grape or a region that has the dyslexic a- attributes. So, so so this one here. Yeah. So I wrote I wrote to the wine society and I I said and quite, I didn't say it was for dyslexia. I sort of said the attributes. I said I need a wine that's had to struggle, and it takes longer to develop, and um, but it comes out with a bit more unusual results. Yeah. Um, you know, which is for me that's kind of dyslexia. Yeah. Um, not all dyslexics are the same. You know, um, m- my friend Abe, who has a, a space design practice um as an interior and he thinks very quickly he gets his but for me you know thinking of ideas is a longer process um so this is what they came up with and you know they they gave me a list of a few and Mm. um after they sent these ones they said yeah this this one so this one the grape comes from a soil that it's very sandy and very Mm. clay y Mm. which isn't particularly good for growing grapes, growing grapes mm. for, for the vines. It has to struggle. The roots have to go deeper. Mm. Um, and I think the brain architecture of a dyslexic, it's more tangled. You know, the the roots or the connections are a bit more all over the place and mm. far-reaching, which is how they're able to come up with more unusual ideas. Um, so it's struggled. It's taken longer. Um, interestingly, also... There's um, some sort of horrendous vine parasite that will attack the roots. Mm. Um, And so the the solution to this is to graft on one grape vine onto another that's more resilient to it. Um, This one came from a vineyard where they didn't need to do that because the clay... It's just terrible for the parasite. Mm. So it's not had this, um, needed this intervention. It's not, it's, and the, yeah, the metaphor here is Mm. through something tough, a dyslexic makes it through, you know, they are resilient in this way. Um, Stronger and, and hopefully better once you open it. Well, let's see, (laughs) let's see. Yeah. Um, Um, and of course, you know, and what I like about this metaphor, um, what I like about this metaphor is that a lot of the time when we're talking about what's great about being dyslexic is we're kind of putting down the different kinds of brain type that aren't dyslexic. But the mm. great thing about this is, you know, wine is brilliant from all over the planet. All these other brain types or vineyards you know, they're all good. It's just you get different results. So that's why I like this because, you know, I think it's very important to talk about all, how all structures within neurodiversity are good and that's useful. That's the word I was looking for. Neurodiversity. Yeah, oh, the, yeah neurodiversity, yeah. That's, that was the one, that's the I, one. Was, I was after. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think as as groups of people, you know, we've evolved in groups and tribes Mm. It's really important to have all these different types of brain. Yeah. I think if if everyone in the tribe was dyslexic, I think it would be a bit of a, a problem. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, this is what this is. I I regularly say that yeah. um, having someone alongside you, whether it's work or in yeah. relationships or anything like that, they have someone that's the opposite of what you are. Yeah, is so helpful. So you're going to pour yeah. that wine into the decanter, are right? you? Yes. Yeah. Let's have it. So I assume you have to get a, you can't use a bigger bottle where it won't fit in there or you just pour it in the top. Um, Do you just pour? I just pour it in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I might introduce, um, I might introduce a funnel at, at some point, um, but yeah, you don't need one. Um, and this is actually a slightly smaller bottle. It's, it is a uh, small bottle, yeah. Yeah, I think it's 500 so pour, centiliters, pour, pour 50 centiliters rather than the normal 75. So, um, so let's put that in. Oh, listen to that sound. Oh, I love the sound of wine pouring. <laughs> it's a nice, nice color, the wine. Um, yeah. So you can see as it 
pours down the neck and reaches the body. Yeah. The wine's running down the inside of the glass wall. It's like a Marks and Spencer's advert. <laughs> it's um <laughs> so so the so the liquid's running in a in a thin sheet. Yeah. So because it's you know, it's all spread to like, I don't know, a millimeter thickness, the liquid. It's all being exposed to the air. So that's getting the oxygen in. So I think the message behind this podcast is dyslexic people like wine. <laughs> it's um Yeah, it's nice. I, I'm really into stuff like that. That's yeah. it, and that's a, exactly the sort of thing I would end up buying for no reason whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just pour that in there. I'm excited about drinking it now. There's too much pouring going on. It's like it's like watching watching someone do a barbecue. I'm going to take that. I'm going to try my fingers in the uh, the two little holes in the side of the glass. Yeah, I don't know if you're selling me the holes in the glass, but no. it's, it's very artistic. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. This this is my favourite podcast so far because there's wine involved. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, and it's quite early in the day. Oh, cheers. 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 Actually, it's really funny. That's I know we're not a wine tasting podcast, but mm -hmm. that is actually a really different wine, and I yeah. drink a lot of wine. <laughs> mm -hmm. I loved hearing how Jim related dyslexia to the wine bottle. As a dyslexic, it was really great having this visual asset onto the podcast. For me, it personifies what this podcast is all about, which is highlighting and empowering the positivity of being different. Speaking to Jim and becoming familiar with his work, he seems to really think through and consider everything he does. I have always strived for perfection in my work, sometimes feeling a bit obsessive about it, so I was interested to see if he felt the same. Take a listen to what he said. When you're dyslexic and you find something that interests you, mm -hmm. you go deep and mm -hmm. really deep. I mean, I have, <laughs> I'm renowned in my family if I've got to meet someone, even if they're like on a private level, I'll do a deep dive mm -hmm. to see what I can find out about before I meet them because yeah. I've become obsessed with that point of meeting people. Yeah. And then once I met them, it's fine and we move on. But I have that with everything. I have that with wine. I do love wine. And at the moment, I've got it with tequila because in this country, yeah. no one's really into tequila. No. It, well, I'm not saying nobody. It, it, no one ever talks about tequila. They talk about whiskey and other stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I someone said to me, try this tequila and I tried it and I loved it. Yeah. And now I've become obsessed with trying loads and understanding how tequila's made and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And I find with it comes back again, I become obsessed with everything I do. Mm -hmm. And then when once I feel like I've reached a point where I've completed it, mm -hmm. I've become I wouldn't say an expert because I'm certainly not a wine expert. I get taught lots. But once I become very knowledgeable in something, I will yeah. then move on to something else. Yeah. Do you find that saying you do? The first object I did. For, for my brand was the was a fruit bowl and it, it was ridiculous looking back but i spent a year drawing it and i would probably do one <laughs> well, drawing the whole, as in i assume this is your full-time job right yeah so you spent a whole year yeah drawing a fruit bowl yes i'd do one a day and i do one drawing a day and i wouldn't be quite happy with it so i'd do another the next day um, and they were all very similar. The, the, the difference between, you you know, you'd struggle to notice the difference between so them. So how do you, how is your thought process in when you're doing this, when you're doing this creative work, what is your yeah. thought press? Well, thought well I wouldn't, I wouldn't call that year creative. It was, a, it was like a year of tweaking, really. The creative bit was before that. So to arrive at the fruit bowl design, yeah, that was creative. So, so I was, um, I was working at a stainless steel factory mm -hmm. in India for a few months and, wow. um, I was there for three months. It was an internship and, uh, there wasn't a brief. They just said, you know, make something nice that we can produce and sell. And I went around the factory and they had these deep draw machines mm -hmm. and, uh, they'd get a flat disc of the stainless steel. They'd put it in the machine and then Mechanically, a, a, a tool, a former, would come and press it into shape. And it stretched it into this a flat disc, a flat circular disc, 
was stretched into the shape of a fruit bowl, like mm. a half sphere. And it, do, it does it in a few stages. You know, it goes through if they yeah, have to yeah. change the tooling. But to my mind, the metal wouldn't behave like that. You know, if I had to guess what would happen, I'd say, well, it'll buckle a few places around the edge and you'll have, you'll have the shape, but it'll have these creases in it. But it doesn't. It's a perfect fruit bowl. Mm. And I'm thinking, well, stainless steel is very stretchy. And I'm thinking I, I wouldn't have thought it was stretchy. I don't, you know... Um, this this knife, for example, is a stainless steel. It's probably not a very good grade of stainless steel, but um, you know the idea that that can be stretched into different shapes. It's sort of it's it's not part of my everyday world. I wanted to show in the finished fruit bowl mm. the evidence of how stretchy the metal was, because um, normally you look at things and you can't see anything about the making mm. um so i thought well if i cut holes in it before it's stretched into that shape you'll see how they've distorted you'll mm -hmm. see they've become ellipses and yeah. um so that was the creative process for that it was sort of looking at the way materials behave how many bowls did you sell oh it's a real do you sell it as it's a real so headache it's do you sell it as art or do you sell it as i don't know really what the word would be as kind of high-end functioning products um yeah hi either, either i mean i yeah I, I call it home homeware playful sculptural homeware i mean both of those are correct it's functional art it's but do you do lots of production of it or is it just one offset you purely do yourself oh no i mean because it takes me so long hmm. once i've designed something i won't put a limited number on them right so and do you send it to other people to develop or do you do do it all by hand yourself throughout the process? Um, I'm leading to something. So, okay. <laughs> so I'll start off. Um, so I'll be drawing it in sketchbooks or on the backs of scrap paper. Yeah. Then when I think I've got something to test out, I'll draw it on my old architect's drawing board. Mm -hmm. um, I might do a foam model out of, I might draw it on the computer and cut out profiles and mm. glue it together and then fill in the space with foam and then, sand it to get the shape at some point i need to get the actual glass maker to make one and see if it really works mm. um so i'll probably get that done in london because it's quite efficient so you've obviously got all these other aspects of the business once once you've created this creative side but what is it earlier you said about it take it took you a year to go through to get the the right prototype to where it is was that was that related to dyslexia or the creative the creative nature you do things and how did you function for a year when that was the main thing you were doing mm -hmm. having struggled with so many things at school i think a dyslexic has a craving to do something brilliantly mm. so i'm not sure if this is the reason but this is my guess i think you're just desperate to do something that's so fantastic. It doesn't matter that you were terrible at everything else. Um, and you don't, you know, you don't just want to do it like good enough. Mm. You just want to blow all those failures out of the water. They don't matter. You've done this amazing thing. So I think that's why day after day I was tweaking it so that it could be the best it could possibly be. And actually I think... It, I probably went beyond the tolerances of the ability of the factory, the craftsmen, in mm. what they're able to do. I think, you know, I was it had these three holes of different sizes and positions, and I think they weren't able to place them on the sphere as precisely as I was in my drawings. Obviously, you've got this creative side of you, and you've got you must have in order to get from concept to finish to sales, you must have an mm -hmm. entrepreneurial side. Mm -hmm. How does your dyslexia help or hinder you? Or what's the great things about dyslexia that allows you to push that from one place, the creative, the process, to out into the world so ev everyone else can benefit from it? I think I, I think it's just determination, this, this, this craving to do something well. It, it will just work through the problems um, until it gets there. Um, I think I still need to work on the entrepreneur side. I think mm. a dyslexic person in, in particular needs to delegate things to 
because you know they've got big gaps in the things that they're good at there's mm. things that they're really not good at so um i have managed to delegate accountancy and bookkeeping mm -hmm. um you know that's outsourced i do work on my own but i do manage to outsource a few parts to it and um yeah for for a dyslexic i think it's really important to get as much done by other people as you can so that you can really concentrate on the bits that are dyslexic strengths like the creativity um have and you then, ever read a, the book a four-hour work week by tim ferris no i haven't so i've dipped into so, his podcast yeah yeah his, his podcast is amazing but the yeah the four-hour work week yeah the premise of the book i think is a bit riskier but yeah um the i the idea that it's there's all these different ways to outsource things mm -hmm. is was a real game changer for me because I assumed when I first started in business that everyone you had to employ everyone and it wasn't until I realised that you could kind of um, mm -hmm. employ it as you, and when you needed people yeah. and only for the time you needed them yeah. and for me as a dyslexic person that was amazing so yeah. even now in my businesses now I have just as many outsource people yeah. as employed people because I don't need them all the time and yeah. they don't and a lot of things for instance my businesses aren't big enough at the moment to have full-time accountancy people mm -hmm. in, on board mm -hmm. so for me I can phone them up anytime I want and they solve everything for me but I don't need to take them on full-time and yeah. that and I said I didn't realize any of that until I read that book yeah that was a, a real big yeah changer for me and this is something you're particularly good at at building enterprises and structures and finding the team around you and it's something i need to work on it's i'm not i'm not there yet i've, I've just taken on uh well not taken on outsourcing the press relations for this yeah. new product and it's a good step for me so you know that's just saving me something that i'm not very fast at do you think it's to do with dyslexia do you think it's your um <laughs> your perfect perfectionism because a lot of the time i find this with people i've spoken to it's um dyslexia is it it's people sometimes put things into dyslexia that mm. aren't necessarily about being dyslexic yeah but they it's easy to put it in there and say that that's the reason why i am would you say your perfectionism comes from dyslexia or just comes from somewhere else um you? i think it's the uh just the, the craving to be great at something just to blow all the failures out of the water. I think that's what it is. So I think that is related. But I think it, it's very hard to tell what attributes are dyslexic and what's just me. Because, you know, it's not like I can spend a day not being dyslexic and see, okay, I'm still <laughs> yeah. like yeah, this. I get yeah. that. For people with dyslexia listening, more in the creative world, doing inventing or designing or anything that you kind of take part in, what advice would you give them when they're listening to this and they might be struggling and whether they can do it or the world's telling them not to do it what would would be the advice you would give to them do things your way not other people's way great thank you for coming oh thanks so much what i love about jim is not that he's just a unique and special artist but that he so powerfully champions neurodiversity his work stands for itself i think he's a testament to embrace things that make you unique jim thank you so much for coming on the show and being the first person to bring me wine as a gift mirabelle brow is a 21 year old chemistry student she's joining me next week on the invisible gift podcast to share her story as a student with dyslexia school wasn't something i was a massive fan of as i think we've established on the episode today so i'm intrigued to see how she overcomes it that episode is dropping next week don't miss out just a couple of quick notes before we go they're important ones first off make sure to subscribe to the invisible gift wherever you listen to podcasts so you can automatically be notified about new episodes one thing that's really important to me is to hear what you guys think about the podcast i want to hear more about the challenges you're facing what you're trying to change in your own life work and family and hear your inspiring stories of how you've overcome the odds to achieve the incredible I know because so many of you are dyslexic that asking you to write something to me is not going to work. So I've worked with the production team on The Invisible Gift and we've come up with an idea. Grab your phone and record us a voice note. If you've got an iPhone, use voice memos. On Android, the options are endless. Once you're happy with your message, 
you can email it to me. My email address is andrew at theinvisiblegift.com. I would love to start sharing some of your audio notes and stories in future episodes. Also, and I'm really excited about this, head to theinvisiblegift.com because that way you can see the amazing artwork that has been commissioned to go along with each episode this season and also find out more about each of the guests I've had the pleasure of speaking to on the podcast. If all of this is way too much for you, I get it. I'm starting a newsletter that includes all this and more and it will come straight to your inbox. It's so simple to sign up at theinvisiblegift.com. You've been listening to the Invisible Gift podcast presented by me, Andrew Kitley, and produced by One Fine Play. This episode was recorded by Kazra. From One Fine Play, James Bishop is the executive producer. Kazra is the audio and visual engineer. Connor Foley is the editorial producer and researcher. Special thanks to Christina, Izzy, and the Cube Studios. Thank you for listening to the Invisible Gift podcast.